Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of John Donne's selected poems. Here we're going to be taking a look at a valediction of weeping. And a valediction is a poem of departure or farewell. Dunn wrote a number of such poems, such as A Valediction Forbidding Morning. So let's take a look at the poem itself. Let me pour forth my tears before thy face whilst I stay here, for thy face coins them and thy stamp they bear. And by this mintage there's something worth, for thus they be pregnant of thee. Fruits of much grief they are, emblems of more. When a tear falls, that thou falls which it bore. So thou and I are nothing then, when on a diverse shore. On a round ball, a workman that hath copies by, can lay a Europe, Africa, and an Asia, and quickly make that which was nothing all. So doth each tear, which thee doth wear, a globe, yea, world, by that impression grow, till thy tears mixed with mine do overflow this world. By waters sent from thee, my heaven dissolved so. O oh, more than moon, draw not up seas to drown me in thy sphere, weep me not dead in thine arms, but forbear to teach the sea what it may do too soon. Let not the wind example find, to do me more harm than it purposeth, since thou and I sigh one another's breath, who e'er sighs most is cruelest, and hastes the other's death. Well, in terms of context, by the time the poem was first published in 1611, Dunn had participated in a number of foreign expeditions, such as his trip to France in 1605. And the poem may function as an appeal to his wife Anne not to grieve as a result of Dunn's departure. Uh, she was renowned as um, really struggling when uh, she suffered periods of absence from him. The verb let functions as allow. Dunn seeks permission to exhibit his emotions here. While pour has connotations of a large volume, let me pour forth my tears. So it represents the extent of Dunn's sadness at having to leave his love. It's crucial for the poem that Dunn's tears are shed whilst I stay here, rather than during the period of absence. The first stanza is devoted to exploring the value of tears that are formed within the proximity of the person who fosters them. So Dunn explores the value of the tears through the conceit of coins, which inherently connote value and suggest the value of his emotions. For thy face coins them, and thy stamp they bear, and by this mintage there's something worth. So as you can hear, we've got um, the semantic field of coins here. Coins in that first use functions as a verb. He exploits, exploits the concept of a mint where coins are produced. The original metal itself is pretty much worthless until it has the stamp of the queen, king or queen upon it. Hence, by this mintage, they are something worth. The conceits used to suggest that Dunn's tears are the only base metal stamped by the image of his love. It's only because they bear the image of his love that they are something worth. Uh, the concept's reminiscent of that employed in The Good Morrow, where Dunn describes the proximity of the lovers, creating a situation where my face in thine eye, thine in mine appears. So the word pregnant works on a number of levels. The most obvious figurative use of the word is that the lover has impregnated Dunn with tears in the sense of being the cause of them. But the image of a pregnant woman also replicates the swollen shape of a tear. The tear contains love's image in the same way that a pregnant woman contains the image of the man, at least if the tears are shed in close proximity to the other person. And pregnant is also associated with fertility, of course, and this concept is extended in the description of the tears as fruits, fruits of much grief they are. Pregnant can also denote full of meaning or significance. It's the woman's image appearing in his tears that render them significant. When a tear is shed, the image that it contains of the lover obviously falls with it. And Dunn frequently uses repetition to suggest a pun. Here, the repetition suggests that the meaning is twofold. Full could mean both the descent of the tear and death, as in to fall down and die. The argument of the first stanza is realised at this point. 
The key to understanding this is appreciating that in the penultimate line, he establishes that the tear contains an image of the lover. As a result, when they're separated on a diverse shore, those images within the tears are missing, and the tears are therefore empty. The thou that falls which it bore is no longer there, so thou and I are nothing. The tears have no more value, so what he's trying to impart is they shouldn't be shed. What's the point of wasting emotional energy on something valueless? The diverse shore itself refers to the distance between them once done as departed. However, the gap between the two shores could represent the sea, a salty expanse that may also complement the salty tears that are shed. Dunn then introduces the conceit of a craftsman taking cutouts of countries in order to construct a globe. The paradox of making all from nothing is explored through the image of the featureless ball being transformed into the earth. Dunn introduces here the concept of the microcosm as the globe represents something far greater than itself. It is the macrocosm. And finally, a key point is that the craftsman can make this transformation quickly, just as the tears can quickly become a world. And therefore, you know, they need to be shed carefully. Just like the creation of the globe, as more tears are formed, they produce a world. Dunn and his lover are the world to each other. And this concept is mirrored in the shape of the tear, mirroring the shape of the world. But also the tears become the world, the microcosm growing to the scale of the macrocosm. In this case, that macrocosm being the earth itself. Dunn concludes the stanza with the hyperbolic claim that the combination of their tears may reach such a scale that they'll overwhelm the physical and spiritual realms. He employs enjambment on the penultimate line there, with mind to overflow this world, resulting in the meaning overflowing over the edge of the line, structurally representing the deluge that may overflow this world. He represents their love as existing on a physical and a spiritual level. They're godlike in their capacity to love to such an extent that their loss could overwhelm the world. And the extended final line, composed of iambic heptameter, conveys this sense of excess and being overwhelmed so that the line semantically is referencing this and is complemented by it structurally. If both of them cry, the result will be disastrous. My heaven may also reference Dunn's lover, who is destroyed by their excessive mutual grief. Dunn begins the third stanza with another image that complements the theme of round things. Tear, coin, pregnancy, globe, earth and the celestial. Here it's moon. The circular imagery might be represented typographically through the exclamative and other O's. So you can see the actual O in that O more than moon, and there's a real predominance of O's in that line. The moon may be a flattering point of comparison for his beloved, given that it connotes the virgin goddess of the moon, Diana. Diana was also associated with fertility, extending the references to fertility in the first stanza, pregnant, fruits, boar. The word more may merely function as a comparative adjective, but Dunn could also be punning on the name of his beloved, Anne Moore. The moon can control the tides, so Dunn pleads with his beloved to avoid using her powers, which, being greater than those of the moon, could influence the seas to overwhelm him. And her power is again asserted through the reference to her sphere. This may be an allusion to her tears, which Dunn has been at pains to associate with the spherical throughout the poem, but it may also suggest her celestial power, given that a common Elizabethan belief held that an angel governed a celestial sphere. This would represent his beloved as angelic. He presents a tension between loving and killing, suggesting that his beloved's love for him has the potential to kill him. In thine arms is representative of love, given its connotations of an embrace, Yet he pleads for her to weep me not dead in these arms. His argument is that her tears are so vehement that they could act as an example to the sea. If her tears are nearly drowning him as they embrace, then it may be a model for the sea's actions when he sets sail. 
in a more practical sense, Dunn knows that he's about to embark on a dangerous journey where the sea may kill him too soon. So he doesn't wish her to emotionally kill him with the grief of loss before the journey even begins. Dunn uses the same concept, but then exchanges tears for sighs. He asks her not to allow the wind to find an example in her size, for an extreme wind would lead to shipwreck. He also claims that as they are one and therefore sigh the same breath, the one who sighs the most is cruelest because they're literally taking air from the other one. So we'll end by taking a quick look at the structure. There are three nine line stanzas, uh, quite an unusual verse form, that could complement the sense of the upsetting emotional state that's being described. There's something irregular about it. In terms of the meter, we've got lines of iambic pentameter, aside from one, five and six, which are iambic dimeter and line nine, which is iambic heptameter. So the shift to dimeter is particularly interesting. It could convey an honest directness, given how abrupt they are. Heptameter, on the other hand, could represent the sense of emotional excess as it overwhelms. With the rhyme scheme, ABBA, CC, DDD. So that rhyme scheme creates a powerful sense of connection and it grows stronger over the course of each stanza. And finally, the forms a dramatic monologue, which allows Dunn the opportunity to present deeply personal feelings in a really direct form. OK, thanks ever so much, folks. Take care. Cheers.